Hello, I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Changemakers, the Future of Health. What does the future of healthcare hold over the next few years? Will we see a shift towards home-based care over hospitals? Will wearables become the go-to for diagnostics? Amidst the uncertainty, Joe Kiani, founder, chairman, and CEO of Massimo, is confident he has the answers. I caught up with Joe in sunny Southern California to dive into his CEO playbook, the game-changing impact of AI in healthcare, the promising realm of wearables, and the battle against medical errors. Yet what truly impressed me was the unique way that Joe thinks about problems. He has a remarkable journey from immigrant, knowing just a few words of English, to becoming an industry powerhouse, driven by a passion for solving big problems and championing justice. He talks about the need to be an agent of good. He's also introduced me to this concept of micro-fixing that can empower all of us to make a difference. Well, Joe, welcome to Changemakers, the future of health. Thank you, John. Great to be with you. I want to start off with You've been talking a lot about the need to move medicine, to move medical care from the hospital into the home. But you started out with all about focusing on the hospital. So how did your thought process evolve? Great question. Um, Our first goal was to make non-invasive monitoring accurate and reliable. Once we reached that goal, we began thinking about what's the best way to really take care of people. And we literally 20 years ago, we had the Blue Sky Sessions. What should healthcare look like 20 years from now? That was 20 years ago? (laughs) Yeah, almost 20 years ago. You know, actually, you happen to be interviewing me on the 35th anniversary of incorporation of Massimo. Uh, So yeah, we began thinking about it and we started imagining how do you solve the problems that are there today? There is errors of omission. There is uh, overburdensome data, uh, alarms hitting the clinicians in the hospital. And there's just what I call the tyranny of now, where decisions are made, made based on that moment instead of taking into account the history of the patient and the historical data that came with the patient. But did you always think eventually this is gonna be able to be done in the home? Or has it been more in recent years as technology has evolved that the home might be the better place instead of the hospital in some circumstances? Well, yeah, the original goal was to create more information about the patient as they come to the hospital. We wanted to get their baseline at home. We wanted to know what was their resting heart rate? What was their normal temperature? Uh, not, we're not all 98.6 degrees. <laughs> so that way, the AI database we were creating, we called Halo, could take advantage of that data, maybe even the genotype, to then allow the clinician to know exactly what is wrong with this patient. Kind of personalized monitoring, precision monitoring, not just precision medicine, but precision monitoring. That was the original goal. And then we began seeing, you know what? This technology we created for the wrist is so good. It really is continuous. It's really accurate. It's personalized. Personalized. And we began with COVID seeing how care can now be done at home, maybe better than at hospitals, maybe better than physicians' offices. And we began thinking about, okay, how do we accelerate that? How do we take it to the home faster? But what's the barrier to doing more in the home? We talked a little bit about it beforehand. Is it reimbursement that people don't want to pay for data that's collected at home? Is it patient acceptance? What I've learned over the years, sometimes people's home is kind of their sanctuary. They don't want to associate it with healthcare? Is it physician acceptance? There's not a way to get that personalized, continuous data that you have on your wrist right now into the right place on the medical record. 
What do you think is the biggest barrier that's preventing us from changing how we deliver care? Well, first of all, I think people like being taken care of at home. Um, and I look at historically how clinicians used to come to the home, whether it was the neighborhood uh, person, <laughs> witch doctor, sure, the real spot. doctor. Mm -hmm. So really what has kept monitoring and care away from home had been uh, a slew of problems like too many people, uh, too much traffic. Uh, when people try to take home monitoring uh, to home 30 years ago, lack of reliable internet or to those days dial up, boy, modems. Um, so I think we've come to a day and age where one, we have reliable uh, communication. Two, we have microprocessing capabilities we could have even dreamt of. We can do video conference calls at images and rates that we never dreamt of. And then we also now have, thanks to Massimo, reliable monitors that you don't need a clinician to figure out what's really going on because you can't really rely on the measurements. You can actually rely on the measurements. So I think the barriers have dropped. And now with the advent of AI that's become ubiquitous, which is really pattern recognition, we can finally give people at home the same kind of measurements with some AI on top that can help them figure things out. And if they need more care, dial up to their doctor, dial up to the best doctor in the world, whatever they're looking for, and get most of what they need done at home. I'm glad you brought up AI because you've been writing about how AI can prevent medical errors. But as you and I both know, a lot of the discussion right now for AI is really about almost an assistant. It's going to help with scheduling and reduce no-shows, or it's going to do the denial letters, not recognizing that insurance companies are going to use AI to write the response to the denial letter that someone used AI to write the original letter. It's not harnessing the power to structure unstructured data and provide those diagnostic and therapeutic recommendations. What's the challenge there? Are we using AI in the right way right now? I guess it's a good thing we all think differently. <laughs> I can't even think about the things people are looking at using AI for. No, I, I think like you, John, AI can be an amazing tool to pick up on patterns and reduce medical errors. And that's what you're doing. Yes. Why aren't more people doing that then? Well, you Is know, it fear? Is it don't get in my lane in, in terms of the doctors don't want to give up any authority? Is it fear of malpractice? Is it that we're just holding AI to an unrealistic standard of perfection when we currently don't have perfection in clinical care? I actually think the tools had not been available. I don't think the doctors are pushing back. I don't, they see that we're overwhelmed by patients. They see that we're going bankrupt trying to care for patients. So I think doctors and nurses that I speak to, they're, they're cheering us on. They want more care at home. They want the use of AI at home. They want the use of AI in their hospital. So in the past, if you think about the problem with AI, first there was the lack of the tools, and secondly, there's this whole walling off of data that companies like mine used to do in hopes to monetize their data. Well, if everyone is walling off their data, there's, it's impossible for AI to look at all the data and help people figure out what's going on. So one of the barriers that we help bring down is the lack of data availability. Because at the end of the day, it's the patient's data, and it should be used for their care, not for each one of us to try to see how much we can make off of it. So I think now with 90 companies pledging to share their data, there is an ecosystem for people to be able to develop algorithms like Halo that we developed to look at everything coming from the monitors, coming from the infusion pumps, anesthesia machines, imaging, blood work, and help clinicians figure out patterns and problems before it's too late. Well, let's use a practical example. 
relating to opioids. And we know the challenges of opioid treatment, opioid overdoses. You're using this strategy of algorithms looking at data to address it. Tell us a little bit about these tools that you're using around opioids. Absolutely. In fact, we do use AI with our opioid halo. The That's first why I brought it up. <laughs> thank you for asking. The first and only FDA-approved device to help reduce opioid-induced respiratory depression. And yes, when people are struggling with opioids, and remember, opioids reduce your pain. Well, guess what other pain it reduces? That pain you feel when you stop breathing, when CO2 is increasing. So because of that, people die in their sleep because they forget to breathe. It doesn't hurt not to breathe. So what we've done with Opioid Halo, we have looked at the patterns of drops in SpO2, changes in pulse rate, changes in other variables underneath to detect when you're going into that state. And when you are, we try to wake you with, a, with our own alarms. And if you don't respond to that, which by the way, many people do, they don't even need Narcan, they'll wake up from it. Then we send a message to the people you've pre-assigned to get the alerts. And if they don't come to you in time, the alert goes to the nearest ambulance with your location to come rescue. So this is a great example how AI and reliable monitoring can help save lives. 110,000 people to 117,000 people died last year from opioid overdose. What if we could reduce that to zero or even to 20,000? You have a great way of thinking about problems. And I mentioned to you when I first saw you that for the last two weeks, I've been studying Joe and uh, reading about him, watching videos. I watched a video that you did for a TED Talk 11 years ago, and you talked about this concept of micro-fixing. Explain to us what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah, I... Do you remember the talk? I do remember the talk. I do remember the talk. And I, and I, uh, as many young people are, I was an idealist. And I was seeing all the injustices of the world, waiting for the solutions to come, big radical solutions. And what I noticed sometimes, those things caused their own problems. And what I began thinking about, if we could all do small improvements around us, every one of us, tackle the little problems we can tackle, then maybe eventually all the problems are solved because some of us can tackle bigger problems than others. So yeah, my idea of microfixing and the way I approach problems is when I come across a problem that I think I can solve, I feel compelled to go after it. I, and I wish everyone would find their own microfix and go after the problems that they think they can fix might be a little bit bigger than them, but they think they can do it. And if we all did that, imagine 50 years from now, we might have a very idealistic world. What's an example now that people should think about this concept of microfixing for? Is it for AI? Is it for digital tools? Yeah, I think in a professional sense, in the world that I find myself in, I find that I have several tools that nobody else has. I have this technology that gives us accurate data, pulse oximetry data, ECG, EEG, and so forth. I also have spent 20 years developing the AI algorithms, Halo. And we also had access to this incredible video compression, decompression technology. We have this cloud we've created. So yeah, I feel compelled that I've got to take all those solutions and help usher in 22nd century healthcare. And what is that 22nd century healthcare? When you and I are not feeling well, we figure out what we need to do at home. And only if there's something that needs to be done to us, do we go out to the hospital or do we go out to a specialist? Otherwise, I wanna put together the tool set, not just these, there's other things coming that helps you figure everything you need to figure out at home. And then secondly, when you go to the hospital, I want all of that information to go with you, including your genotype, your phenotype, so that someone who doesn't know you, using the AI systems like Halo we created, will help them know, you know, is a SAT of 93 really dangerous? Or is it, you're normally 95, so it's not that bad for you. 
When are we going to get there? Because we've been talking about issues of interoperability. That's somewhat what you're referencing to for, since I've been a physician for, for 25 years. You're an optimist by nature, I know, from having talked to you. Um, when are we going to get there, Joe? Well, what I've noticed... This vision that you have. Yeah, what yeah. I've noticed, I'm always a little too optimistic. Uh, but what I've... So I would say normally, I'd say five years. We can get there in five years. But what I've really noticed, really consequential changes happened in 10 to 15 years. So I really believe in 10 to 15 years, even if I'm wrong, it will happen. And by the way, when you go to the hospital, you can go home a lot earlier because of these tools exist in your home. So remember, the longer you're in a hospital, the more likely you are to be subject to a medical error. The third leading cause of death in our country is medical errors. And so I want to get people in and out of that hospital as AI fast as we can. AI can help reduce that. You know, much of change makers is about leadership. And you have a fascinating story. You came here at the age of nine. You only knew three words of English. I love this. You say you wanted to be a, a doctor, but chemistry did you in. <laughs> so you became an engineer. But you graduated high school at age 15. And what some people may not know is your parents went back to Iran when you were 14. You talk about how your sister helped take care of you and she was tough, she had curfews, I like that. <laughs> but how did she that- She was just a year older than me too. <laughs> that's well, the that's crazy not, thing. That, she's... <laughs> how did that impact how you approach problems? Well, first of all, I think I've lived in a high problem state <laughs> for many years of my life, and I think it may be pretty tough. Um, I also had to reflect many times as a young person of what does it all mean? Uh, and recognizing that death is inevitable. You know, 100 years from now, unfortunately, everyone around us won't be here. You realize, you know what? Let's just go take your best shot at things. And be, be an agent for good. Just try. What does it matter? If you fail, you fail. <laughs> what does it matter? So yeah, that's, that's how I approach things. And I think strong set of guiding principles, integrity, ethics, keeping your promises, thriving on fascination and accomplishment, not power and greed, trying to make every day as fun as possible, improving yourself every year. And don't forget, we're given a chance to help each other and help. My, my effort is to help patients. My challenge is to help people. And even though I couldn't become a doctor, I still want to help people. You, well, being an engineer and studying engineering is just as good. <clears throat> you talk about that in many ways you wanted to address injustice from an early age, that you enjoy talking to people, getting to know people. And, and you have this great line where you talked about you were fired as a busboy from one of your first jobs because you talked too much to people. What is it that you like talking about to people? You know, I think at the end of the day, I know it sounds corny, but it's those wonderful, happy smiles and reflections we give each other that really matters. And it's showing love to each other, showing kindness to each other. And I, and I really feel like it can be infectious. I think if you show kindness towards me, I'll show kindness towards the next person. And I, and I really wish if there's someday <laughs> we do start genetically altering each other, get rid of the mean gene. <laughs> Emphasize the kind gene. So yeah, I think by talking to people, by hearing them, not only you can learn from them, from anybody you can learn something from, but you can hopefully listen to them, see them, hear them, and help them on their journey. If I walked around this building and I asked people, what's Joe's leadership style? What would they tell me? <laughs> I don't know. I hope they would tell you that I lead by example. I hope they tell you that I'm obsessed with making things better, helping people. I hope they'll tell you I'm kind, and um, I appreciate every one of them. And we wouldn't be here without every one of them. 
We're here on the 35th anniversary of Massimo, 35 years. What's your reflection on those past 35 years? And what do the next few years hold for you? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I, I am so proud of what we have accomplished. You know, our technology has eliminated blindness in the NICU. 2,000 babies a year in the United States were going blind because of retopathy prematurity, because pulse oximeters were falsely reading too low when they were wiggling, and the nurses and doctors were increasing the oxygen in those incubators. That's gone. We have helped detect critical congenital heart defects in newborn. Couldn't be done before. They had to do echo, which nobody did. Now with pulse ox, the accuracy is such that pre-post-ductal difference of 3% or more tells them there's something wrong. So I have a lot to be proud of. And we didn't just stop with pulse ox. My team and I brought something we call Rainbow, the only technology to measure hemoglobin non-invasively and continuously, carbon monoxide, met hemoglobin, PVI. That little tricorder we saw in Star Trek, we have made it. And it's there for people to use a hospital in France reduced mortality by 30% by using that technology, 30 and 90 days after surgery. And then I look to that, and, I'm, and that could be enough. We could just sail in the sunset and be proud of what we did. But I look at the next 35 years, what we just talked about, taking care to the home, bringing AI all around from home to the hospital to help clinicians detect problems before it's too late, to help people to live healthier, longer lives. I think we're just starting, and I'm excited about what we're going to do the next 35 years without me <laughs> as the team moves on with this incredible culture of solving problems that other people think are unsolvable. Why do you think differently than others do when it comes to health? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good one. Why do we think differently? You know, part of it is I think it's a waste of life to try to do me too stuff. I think we have gifted people here. We gotta go after the problems other people think are impossible. We gotta improve the science, improve medicine by solving what people call unsolvable. Otherwise, Eric, we're wasting time. The one thing I'm really proud of this building, if this building wasn't here with this team, a lot of these innovations wouldn't be here. Most of the companies around me there's five other companies doing what they're doing. So, yeah, I think it's a waste to just copy things, <laughs> make things slightly better. you got to go for the hard problems. Well, Joe, I want to thank you for taking the time today to, to share how you're thinking about health and changing how we deliver health care. Thanks for having me on your program, John. Pleasure to meet you. I feel like I found a like-minded individual <laughs> across me. <laughs>